Okay, so let's see how this works. So a standard frame that we would use to transfer data looks like up here. It looks like the top version here, my top chart. We have the destination MAC address first, then the source MAC address, then the type field. And that type field identifies the layer 3 protocol that we're going to use in the packet. The FCS then, the frame check sequence, that's where we put the CRC, the cyclical redundancy check, to make sure that our frame is valid, to make sure that our frame that was sent is the same as the frame that was received. A tagged frame, on the other hand, will add in this VLAN tag. So we go destination MAC address, source MAC address, then VLAN tag information. All right, and that VLAN tag is there so that we can put in the VLAN identifier for that particular frame. This piece is actually added in to the frame. The frame is not reconstructed. So we stick the VLAN tag in. We don't rebuild the whole frame. Okay. Now I say this is an 802.1Q frame, and I also call it a tagged frame. We also oftentimes call this 802.1Q. We just call that .1Q oftentimes. And what that is, is it's the IEEE standard for tagging frames on a VLAN trunk. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers in the 802 specification, which is all Ethernet E stuff, <laughs> Ethernet E, I mean like Ethernet like, right? All that Ethernet stuff is in the 802.1Q specification is specifically for tagging frames. Now that's not the only method we have to encapsulate frames over a trunk. All right, so we have this .1Q. It's widely used, has multi-vendor support. It's very well supported in industry. People know how to use it. You, as a network engineer, will need to know how to do .1Q frame tagging or setting up a .1Q trunk port. Same thing. The other type is inter-switch link. This is very rarely used, and it's only available on specific Cisco switch models. We can only use ISL on very specific Cisco devices. It's not used often. It's not compatible with other non-Cisco devices because this ISL is a Cisco proprietary VLAN tag for Cisco devices only. We don't really actually use the ISL very much. Some switches, though, will require you to specify which trunk encapsulation type you are interested in using on that link. So if your switch supports multiple trunk encapsulation types, both .1Q and ISL, then you'll have to choose which one you want to use. Most likely we're going to choose the .1Q, and we actually have to manually specify that in our configuration. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to show you how to configure this. So what I have set up here is two switches. I have a Cisco 2950 Layer 2 switch and a Cisco 3560 Layer 3 switch. Now, what the heck's the difference between a Layer 2 and a Layer 3 switch? Ultimately, for our purposes, in this example, nothing. Uh, layer 3 switches can behave like Layer 2 switches. The only difference in a Layer 3 switch is that Layer 3 switches have the option of having routing and router functions built into the switch itself. So it's kind of like having a router and a switch combined into one device. This is in contrast to our 2950 switch, which is a pure Layer 2 device, only Layer 2. For this particular demonstration, though, I'm using the 3560 switch because it supports two types of trunk encapsulation protocols, both ISL and .1Q. So we're going to have to specify the Layer 2 encapsulation protocol we're going to use for our VLAN trunks on that 3560, and we're not going to have to do that on the 2950. So I wanted to show you the difference of how we configure these devices when they can support multiple trunk encapsulation mechanisms. Okay, so over on the left, I have VLAN 10, and this is part of network 192.168.10.0. And then over on the right, I have my web servers, and that's part of network 10.0.0.0 slash 24. So what I want to do is I want to hook up on 2950, I want to configure port F01 to be on VLAN 10. F02 to be on VLAN 20, and then F0 slash 24 to be my trunk port to carry both VLANs 10 and 20. Same thing down on the 3560 switch.